I'm on a small piece of land on the Arkansas side or the west bank of the Mississippi River. This is called Chicken Island. The river has always played a vital role in the development and the history of the United States. In the Civil War, both the North and the South felt that control of the river was an integral part, a great piece of their war effort, their strategies. During the war, the Union Army often conscripted steamboats in order to ferry supplies and troops to their armies in the South. As the war ended, some of the steamboats were used to carry paroled prisoners back to their homes. On one such trip, the steamboat Sultana, along with over 2,000 Union paroled prisoners and 300 passengers and crew, caught fire and burned, sinking into the Mississippi River. Just a short walk from here, and about 30 feet under the soil, lies the wreckage of the Sultana, still undisturbed after 150 years, and yet so close to the city of Memphis, Tennessee. Who were the men aboard the Sultana, and where did they come from? What happened on that rainy, fateful night on the Mississippi River that would become the greatest maritime disaster in American history? Most of the 2,500 aboard were paroled Union soldiers recently released from Confederate prison camps in Cahaba, Alabama and Andersonville, Georgia. Cahaba Prison, located a short distance from Selma, Alabama, was a partially constructed cotton compress. Unfinished, it sat aside the confluence of the Alabama and Cahaba rivers. Close to 1,800 of the men aboard the Sultana were from the prison at Cahaba. A lot of most of the survivors were from Cahaba because they were a little better shape. It was a cotton warehouse. Actually, it was a, not an old one, but a new one that was never finished. It was put up, it was, the warehouse was built when they brought the railroad in 1856 into Cahaba, 1856, 1859's Carter, And they built this warehouse to serve uh, bringing the cotton in and holding it for the, off the train, holding it for the river boats to carry it to Mobile. And so it was, the roof was not quite finished. That's why you hear some of them call it the old building and talking about raining in the center of it because mainly it just wasn't a finished building. Referred to as Castle Morgan by the prisoners, Cahaba saw over 8,000 men pass through its gates in the few months of its existence. Designed to house a maximum of 500 soldiers, it often held over 3,000. Each prisoner had barely five square feet of personal space and it was almost impossible to lie down. It was the most crowded prison north or south, but our death rate was lower than any other prison, mainly because our water supply was good. Samuel Dyer was a prisoner of war in Cahaba Prison. I have the actual letters that he wrote home to his wife, and as you read those letters, the story just resonates and, and makes, you, makes me weep. Um, I read about how he loved his wife and how he loved his country and wanted to serve his country. After enduring several, several months in Cahaba Prison, he was uh, taken with the other prisoners to Vicksburg, waited there, wrote home. In one of his letters he said that he had uh, his first good meal in months of some, some uh, pork and kraut. And um, finally they were put aboard the Sultana and of course, I don't know where he was on the Sultana or exactly how he died, whether he perished in the initial explosion or whether he drowned, but he did perish in the Sultana disaster. When he died, I think he was 35. Um, he left four children. The youngest was only five and a half months old when he left home in um, the fall of, of 1862. My great-great-grandfather was Adam Schneider of Cincinnati, Ohio. He was a German immigrant, like so many soldiers, came from somewhere else. He was <clears throat> 42 years old when he was drafted into the Army, uh, 183rd Ohio. They trained for three weeks and then they sent them to Franklin, Tennessee. And on, it was the first day of his first battle, which was a victory for his side. He was captured and sent to Cahaba Prison. Uh, then from there, of course, to Vicksburg and then was on the Sultana. He did die, he drowned. 
The heavy rains of February 1865 flooded the Alabama River. Castle Morgan flooded above knee level on the prisoners for over four days. The flood came in there, the river came up, and it's right there on the bank, and it's a big main flood, first major flood in Cahaba at that time. It's one of the reasons why the town didn't make it after the war. And, um, and it flooded, and it depends on who you talk to. Some talk about it being knee deep, some probably waist, waist deep, um, at least three feet or more in the prison itself. And uh, for a while there, they were all standing in the water in the prison. Some would climb up in the rafters and, uh, and lay up on the rafters or sit up on the rafters to get out of the water. And then ready to, and within a couple of days, they brought a barge in there. And they brought a barge in, backed up against the prison, and allowed the men to get out and climb up on the barge to get them out of the water. And it's, when the flood, as soon as the flood was over, they, they shut down the prison itself. That's when they started moving them towards Vicksburg. The conditions at Cahaba Prison were horrid, but nothing like those at Andersonville. Officially named Camp Sumter, Andersonville Prison in southern Georgia furnished the remaining POWs aboard the Sultana. It was open for only 14 months from February 1864 to April 1865. The camp was a simple stockade wall made of straight Georgia pine standing 20 feet in height and encircling 27 acres. Over 46,000 men would enter its gates as prisoners of war. More than 25% of them would die within its walls. Starvation, disease, brutality, and even murder would kill nearly 13,000 imprisoned men. The prisoners that were housed here in Andersonville had been captured mainly in the Western Theater, uh, Tennessee, um, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi and um, some of them were actually brought from prison camps in Virginia uh, when the Confederates started, our Union forces started threatening uh, Richmond and those areas, they brought a lot of the Union prisoners to Andersonville uh, and brought, of course, all the diseases uh, with them. The comparison of the photographs of survivors, they looked like those that you would see from Auschwitz. Uh, Andersonville's been compared as a, in some circles, a concentration camp, which it absolutely was not. The result, the conditions were about the same, however, it was not the intended. Most of the prisoner deaths in Andersonville were caused by acute starvation and disease aided by severe malnutrition. Uh, the basic ration was a piece of salted pork about the size of three fingers and a cup full of coarsely ground cornmeal, which included quite often the husk, the, um, uh, the cob itself, and it was up to them to cook it down and, and make a mush out of it. They were overcrowded, and uh, you know, just, just being the thing, uh, the men would get together in groups of three or four and put the meals together, and then they were, either wood was brought up to the prison for them to get, or sometimes they were, some of them were allowed to go out and gather up firewood, and each one of them had, each little group of men would build a fire and cook. The men were almost totally exposed to the elements and used whatever they could scrounge up as a cover from the rain, cold winter nights, or the burning summer sun. What's behind me is a representation of the typical kind of uh, shelters that these men were surviving for such a long time with. Uh, if they were ex captured uh, in, in March when they had tents with them, they, and if it wasn't t taken from them, they would have them with them here and that would be the shelters that they had. The five acres of the low area where the creek runs through uh, was pretty much a standing cesspool, so unusable. And then you had the space between the deadline and the prison wall. Once that was removed away, uh, the count was basically six foot by six foot per man, which is the size of a grave, ironically. As was true about any Confederate or Union prison camp, uh, they had very little uh, health care, they knew nothing about sanitary conditions. In fact, here at uh, Andersonville, the Confederate camp were for the guards was upstream uh, of the prison camp itself. And so the water, by the time it reached the prison camp, was already polluted. Nearly 200 Confederate guards at Andersonville died of the same diseases and conditions as did the prisoners. One of those prisoners was Joseph Taylor Elliott, the son of a Union Army general. 
both in the book that Joseph Taylor Elliott wrote and in his obituary. It says that he was in Andersonville and they don't have the records here as of yet, but he wrote about the march to the trains and how the men were like skeletons carrying each other to the trains. And I just think what an awful experience for him to have survived all those battles, be captured at the Battle of Spring Hill, come here and spend months in Andersonville prison towards the end of the time when there was so much decimation and then to go on the train to Camp Fisk and then to go aboard the Sultana, finally being able to go home. And here the ship explodes and he had saved a spot on the ship for himself and he had put his hat on a cot so that he could have that spot and then somebody took his spot and so he found a different spot. Well that man was killed. My relative was John T. Alexander. Um, during the time frame that he was gone, his wife had two young daughters and during that time frame one of the little girls, Mary Alice, died in, 19, in 1863 and his other daughter survived and um, after, with my relative, all the history books say that he survived the Sultana and he did not. He was killed on the Sultana. Just days after the South surrender at Appomattox, an exchange of prisoners agreement gave hope to thousands that they were going home. To implement the exchange, steamboats were conscripted by the Union Army to ferry soldiers north. The Sultana, with a weakened and leaking boiler, received the most men due to bribery and corruption. At 2 a.m. on April 27, 1865, in a heavy rain and with a swollen Mississippi River, the boilers exploded, setting fire to the boat. The blast was heard in Memphis, Tennessee, seven miles south. Around 2,500 passengers and crew were aboard and nearly 1,800 would be killed. 2,300 men were placed on a boat designed to carry 376. Uh, and that, to me, the, is the ultimate tragedy, is the fact that they weren't being sent to some battlefield or ba uh, you know, some battle. They were being sent home. Uh, and to have survived the Civil War, survived Andersonville and Cahaba, and then to be placed on a defective steamboat that was not safe, known not to be safe, by their own forces, by the Union forces, and then to be sacrificed, um, it, it to me is the ultimate tragedy. The futility is just, it's hard for me to comprehend why that could happen to these men. Some people want to know why do we try to remember this? Why do we remember this? Well, the men themselves wanted to be remembered because they they met they met for years until the, you know until the last one died, and they always wanted a monument. Uh, they wanted this, the federal government to acknowledge the fact that um, this was uh, the greatest disaster in U.S. history. They're always looking for that, and it never happened. I'm standing here next to the memorial to the Sultana in Marion, Arkansas, the last resting place of the Sultana itself. We wonder why has the story of the Sultana been lost to us? Well, there are several reasons. Most importantly, the Civil War had been going on for over four years, and a war-weary people were tired of the stories of death. They were tired of losing their family and loved ones. They didn't want to hear any more about the Civil War and about death. But there were other events that were taking place at the same time which pushed the Sultana story off of the front pages. President Abraham Lincoln's death train was making its way across the northern states and being viewed by millions. John Wilkes Booth had been trailed, captured, and killed just a few hours before the Sultana sank. Joe Johnson, the last great general commanding the last large army of 75,000 men of the Confederacy surrendered in Georgia within 24 hours prior to the explosion and sinking of the Sultana. These stories pushed the story of the Sultana off the front pages of the news. 
Over 1,800 men perished aboard the Sultana on April the 27th of 1865. More men died aboard this boat than died at many of the great battles of the Civil War. Yet there is no national monument, no formal remembrance except for a few monuments here and there in locales. The exhibit you're about to view contains many of the few relics remaining of the boat Sultana and its passengers and crew. We hope that you enjoy this exhibit and we hope that you learn well the story of the Sultana, the last great tragedy of the Civil War. Send me a 